And as you can see, we have lots to eat. Snap it off the face. And it roots coming in. And I don't want them to be stunted. Good morning. Welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather. If you are new here, I like to do garden tours every week during our growing season. So we are growing in Southwestern Kentucky. It's zone 7A. For years, I kept saying we were in 7B. I know they recently changed the zoning. This is not part of that. This is just me not realizing where I am on the map apparently, but we are in zone 7A technically. And I believe we have had our last rust. If you've been following our channel, we have a goat named Breezy who gave birth. The morning that she gave birth was our last frost out on the 10 day and even the monthly forecast. We have nothing even close, so it's garden season. At the front of our raised bed garden, we have these two U-shaped beds that my husband made. He put them in in 2020. They are starting to fall apart. These are untreated wooden beds. And I'm not sad that we did this. I don't wanna grow in treated wood, but truthfully it does not last very long. So we're making plans to cover these beds with cedar. And so they're gonna get a little bit bigger, but those other beds, I believe they're pine boards, they're just gonna break down and become part of the soil within the cedar that we put around them. I don't know if that is going to be a this year project or not, probably not. But you can see I have quite the lettuce assortment going on in here. Leafy greens are some of my most favorite things to grow. And you can see I have the lettuces packed in quite densely. Actually what I did for some of this was just sprinkle down seed on the top of the soil, rough it in a little bit and keep it watered. And we have some pretty densely packed uh, lettuce plants here, but that is fine. When we used to buy lettuce or salad mix at the grocery store, we'd get those clamshells filled with like baby greens. And basically that's what these are going to be. Some of these plants are getting big enough to where I could start harvesting from them, but I think I'm gonna wait. What I do when I come out to harvest a salad is I'll actually just bring the whole salad spinner out here and I'll pick into the salad spinner, go in and give it a good whirl. And then we've got a salad straight from our farm. I had actually started some lettuces in like a microgreens tray and I just transplanted hunks of little lettuce plants from that tray into this bed to fill in some of the gaps that were here. And these are several different lettuce plants planted close together. I believe this is the Rocky Top mix. So these are not gonna form a head. These are gonna stay small, but some plants I did plant one of. You can see there's a lettuce down here. These will form a head. And as you can see here, I have three broccoli plants. These are the only broccoli plants that lived through transplanting. We have a decent bird population here. And if I put plant starts out too young, they eat them up. And that's what happened. These ones were a little bit bigger. And as you can see, we're starting to form heads. So it won't be long before we're harvesting at least a little bit of broccoli out of the raised bed garden. Over in this wing, there's nothing actually planted over here, but on this side of the board, I did plant quite a lot of Kalima bush beans and they're underneath the mulch here. It was just a couple days ago. And so we don't have any germination yet. Um, but I'm eagerly awaiting those. I planted, I think it's every four inches, there's a plant in this little space and we'll have tons of green beans. I don't have a lot of the garden mulch right now. This is actually refuse hay from my goats and it's working really well as a mulch. The thing about hay versus something like straw in the garden, both are really good. Um, hay does have more of a nutrient content than straw does. And so as it breaks down, it adds more than just organic matter to the bed. And I like that. I put a green stalk in the garden and I think we're going to fill this today since we are past our estimated last frost date. You can tell that I don't trust the winds that we have around here to not knock this over. Now these tiers, I mean, when they're filled with soil, especially when the soil is moist, they are quite heavy, but still, <laughs> I sleep better at night having these T-posts in here and the strap around it. This thing is going nowhere. So these beds that are down here, these were here when we bought the farm and I've really enjoyed growing in them. I have more of the lettuce mix over here. These are actually volunteer garlics. If you are not familiar with the term volunteer, a volunteer plant is a, a food plant 
basically, I guess it depends on if it's something you want or not, but it's a plant that is growing where maybe it grew last year, where maybe some seed fell, or probably in this case, where I left a couple cloves in the ground. And so they're not hurting anything there. And so I'm gonna let them grow. Over on this side, this is our elephant garlic bed. I have been growing elephant garlic for a couple years. And we haven't honestly eaten a lot of it because it's hard to find. I found two bulbs at our local Amish store. And with elephant garlic, you get maybe four, four to six cloves per bulb. So I started with very little and I wanted to just multiply those bulbs. And we are at the point now where we can actually plant like an entire bed's worth. I'll have some to save back to plant another bed next year and we'll have lots to eat. This is going to be a little while before it's harvestable. I did have some that I left in the ground from last year. So those plants are a lot bigger. I do have a spinach plant that I planted at the end of last season. This might actually be more than one plant. I am not excellent at growing spinach. So I decided to leave this here amongst the garlic and we can pinch off leaves here and there for our salads as we'd like. Over in here, I transplanted a lot of dinosaur kale. It didn't really love being transplanted. You can see we've got some yellowing leaves. I had sown this kale quite thickly in a microgreens tray. And when I, when I separated it out, each little kale plant, when it was really tightly um, sown like that, had sort of shaded each other out. So even though I did acclimate the entire tray to the sun, separating them out exposed the leaves to even more sun. So they are shocked a little bit, but we have had some cloudy days the last couple of days and we're still gonna have, we're gonna continue to have some cloudy days coming up. So they should bounce back fine. I really would like to have enough kale to actually preserve some in the freezer. We love adding kale to all kinds of dishes, soups, casserole. It's just a great way to add in greens and nutrition. So I have some kale plants that I did put in start pots or later in the winter and transplanted out here. These are the ones that the birds didn't get. I have started harvesting off of these. I can't remember the name of this variety. If I can remember, I'll put it in the words down here. I think this is a a blue something <laughs> kale but this particular kale variety i recognize it as one that one of my amish friends grew last year and it was doing really well for her and staying sweet well into june and that's what i want i want something that's going to last that's going to be delicious so i can preserve it so when it comes to harvesting kale we do a cut and come again method so we can get as much out of the plant as possible. And when you do cut and come again, what you'll do is actually harvest some of the lower and outer leaves and you leave some of the more young tender leaves in the center and those are going to grow and the plant is gonna to continue to producing leaves out of the center. So in doing that, it keeps the plant alive and producing. We don't just cut the whole thing off at once and we get more out of it. I have some smaller kale plants here. Some of these are ones that were transplanted as well, some of the dinosaur kale, but this red Russian was kale that I sprinkle sowed in here. And it's coming up quite nicely. Here's another variety of kale right here. And on this side of the trellis here, I planted some lettuces. These are individual plants, so these guys should form a small head for me. And this is actually a blackberry plant. We've got the blackberry over here. This blackberry was put in here a few years ago. It's the triple crowned thornless blackberry. I don't see any flowers yet, but it's really started to put on lots of foliage. So what we did is actually stick the others, I think six blackberry plants over in this side of the bed and we've allowed it to kind of cascade and travel that way. So <laughs> this is the blackberry situation. I'm not mad about it. We are seeing little blackberry plants pop up where we don't necessarily want them, but it's fine. It's really not hard to hit those with a mower or a weed whacker and just keep things manageable. So moving on to the center beds here. Um, over here, I did put in some dill. I scattered sewed a little bit of dill and I can see tiny bits of it coming up. There's one there, there's one back there. There's not as many plants coming up in here as I would have expected and I did run out of seed. So I think what I'm going to do is just go to my local nursery and pick up some larger dill plants and put them in here. What I aim to do is have the dill ready and usable, like big enough to use by the time I have cucumbers to pickle. And so it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a balancing act. <laughs> This next bed I actually have dedicated. We have two Carlos Muscadine grapes that we put in. 
at the end of winter. There's one here. You can see we're starting to get a little bit of foliage on that. And there is actually another one over there. But these guys are gonna be living on these cattle panel trellises here. And they're going to be one of those perennial permanent fixtures in this garden. So we're starting to hit the real perennial part of this garden. One of the perennial things that I put in the garden not long ago are these Egyptian walking onions. I bought these off of Etsy. And I'll link the shop where I bought them in the description box below. I'm not affiliated with them, but they sent some beautiful walking onion bulbs that all did really well. They're starting to put on their greens. And Egyptian walking onions are essentially like a perennial onion. We are huge fans of green onions and also shallots. And these onions are perfect for both of those applications. So I'm very excited to have them as part of a perennial landscape over here. Funny, I thought that there were some mushrooms coming up, but it's not, it's actually, it's beans. <laughs> Last year I grew beans on this trellis and some of them fell when they dried and these will probably germinate. I'll throw some over there. That's how volunteers happen. In the center of this area, I have established a very lush bed of oregano. This has been growing here since 2019. I love it. It is starting to encroach a little bit over here. Oregano's in the mint family. Mints do this. They tend to kind of overtake everywhere, anywhere that you put them. There's some little gaps and things where it was able to weasel through underneath the soil and get over here. It's not really a big deal to me. Looks like we're only a couple weeks away from our first harvest of oregano, which is good because I've run out in the kitchen. There's some more Egyptian walking onions over here, as well as some weeds. And I do have our second muscadine grape, which also is putting on some green things. So this bed, I would really like to dedicate to chamomile flowers. So I put a chamomile flower in here that I have not grown before. The chamomile that I have grown before, I believe is like a German chamomile, the really common little white flower with the yellow center. These particular plants were advertised as perennial and they are yellow flowers. I don't know if they are awesome for tea or not. The white variety, the little German chamomiles, those are they're not exactly perennial. They will reseed quite readily. I actually expected to see some volunteers of that in my garden by now, and I haven't, so I'm not sad that I planted these. But that one, we've grown that a lot in the past. The German chamomile is very good for tea. If I don't end up getting any volunteers of that, I will probably try and seed some of that in this bed as well, and we'll have like a dual chamomile bed over here, hopefully for a really long time. I'm assuming that what makes this particular plant perennial is that the root system survives winter. I'm not sure though. I've got quite a few little plants that have come up though. Can you guys tell what these are? Bonus points if you know what plant this is. That's a tomato. There are a million little volunteer tomato plants in this bed and the tomato that that is is a yellow currant tomato that really likes to self seed on my farm. I have not planted it in several years like intentionally because every single year I just find it. I find it and I'm able to transplant it and grow it. So there it is. I have some in the greenhouse as well. <laughs> I will not be letting all of these become mature plants but some of them I'm not gonna grow them on here though, I'll move them. So back here, I have several different strawberries. This is actually the most full selection of strawberries that I think we've had. Many of these are the Ozark Beauty strawberry and they've started to put on their flowers. But I also put in a variety of strawberry that has a white berry. And I don't know what's what, I just sort of plugged the crowns in the ground and so we'll have to wait till they fruit to figure out which plants are, are the white ones. I need to go ahead and mulch in here pretty soon to help hold in moisture and to keep the weeds down. Speaking of weeds though, I sometimes will receive criticism about how messy my garden looks. And it, at this point, it just rolls off of my back because I know how productive this garden is despite the weeds. And really what is considered a weed is relative. So we live in the middle of agricultural farmland. It's big monocultures almost on all four sides. Behind us, there's a military installation. And very recently, they came and sprayed. They sprayed Roundup and a fertilizer. And so these fields 
over here used to be full of things like purple dead nettle and different varieties of like wild mustard, lots of flowering things for the pollinators. And now for miles, there's none of that. There are little pockets of it here and there in yards. And I have noticed they're not out today because it's sort of cold and cloudy, but the pollinators are really enjoying the weeds that I have in my garden. And truthfully, a lot of these weeds are edible for us as well. So this here, this is a plant called chickweed and this is edible. I'm not super awesome at remembering what everything is for. I just know that it's good. And if I want it, I can look it up in my Peterson Field Guide. This is plantain down here. These are the purple dead nettle that I was talking about. This is edible for humans and the pollinators really love it. So yeah, I mean, I guess I could weed whack around here to clean things up and just make it look better. But why when it's beneficial? So there's my, there's my thoughts on that. That's good for the pollinators. It's edible and good for us and it's not in my way. So I don't care about it. Next to the strawberries, I have some more elephant garlic. This is sort of a volunteer as well. I haven't planted this in a couple years. This little plot here is actually where I put my first bulbs of elephant garlic that I bought at the store. And when elephant garlic comes to maturity, it has these little mini bulbs on the bottom of the big bulb. They're, they're called garlic corms. They're really little and they fall off of the bulb very easily. And the corms likely have fallen in this bed. So if you can get your hands on even just a couple bulbs of elephant garlic, you will be overrun with it, which is a good thing in no time flat. Another volunteer that we have in our garden quite plentifully is cilantro. Um, I have planted cilantro one time and let it flower one time, and now it comes back every year. The strawberry beds actually had a ton of it in there, and I did transplant that over, and we'll go over there in just a second, but there's more here back behind the raised bed garden. This is one of our newest beds where we stuck our legacy blueberry plants and then we have some flowers and even a little bit of fruit. Can you see these little blueberries here? They still have some maturing and growing to do, but that's fun. This is the asparagus bed. I have a few different types. I believe the green is Mary Washington and I forget the name of this, but it's a purple variety. You can see there's a plant there. And there's one there. We established these beds in, I think it was 2021. And when we put the crowns in, they were two years old. Asparagus crowns can live and produce for decades. And so we get to harvest pretty heavily at this point. And I'm so excited. I miss the asparagus season when we don't have it. We get asparagus from usually about the end of March well into June. And by the time June comes, I am a little bit sick of it, but when we don't have it for many months, I look forward to March a lot. This one is probably decently harvestable in size. I wait till they're about a foot tall before I harvest. And to harvest asparagus, all I do is just snap it off at the base like that. If you have never had homegrown asparagus, it is nothing like the store-bought stuff. That stuff tends to be pretty woody, especially as the stalks get a lot larger. That is not the case for homegrown asparagus. The stalks can be huge and fat and super, super tender and an amazing buttery type texture. It's just lovely. This, this one is really, really sweet. I love it. I look forward to this so much. So at about June time, I will start to leave the stalks that the plant is putting up in order to let them do what they do. They get really tall, they open up and they become these beautiful wispy fronds. They put on flowers, which eventually get pollinated and create little red berries. And those little red berries fall and reseed themselves. So these are all little first year plants. You don't harvest them like this, obviously. Aren't those cute? <laughs> I do have some wine cap mushroom spawn that I put in these beds before I amended and added more mulch over the winter. It's just been a little bit cold for those, for that mushroom mycelium to push up any of the fruiting bodies, but I'm very excited and looking forward to that. I put more of the mushroom mycelium over in this bed, and this is where I transplanted some of the cilantro. Now, <laughs> the cilantro didn't exactly love the transplanting process. We had a little bit of transplant shock, but these guys will recover fine and be nice and full. And they're gonna help shade this bed, which is gonna be good for the mushrooms mycelium. Mushrooms do not like a lot of light at all, and they don't like a lot of wind, and these plants are gonna live in symbiosis. So can you see the like white fuzzy stuff? 
down in here, all that. That's the mycelium. So mushrooms are happy. They're just not fruiting yet. Behind this bed is another plant that's gonna help shade the mushrooms. This is gonna be a good relationship. This is my elderberry. I cannot remember what type of elderberry these are. Uh, these have only been in here a few years and it's huge. And they are starting to push out little baby elderberry plants along the ground. These are a little bit in the way, but a lot like the blackberries, I can just mow these down, which is kind of sad, but I don't necessarily want them shading out this side of the garden. So over here on this side, is a space that my kids have grown a garden in for a couple of years. We have since given them their own raised beds that are smaller and each child is able to manage that a lot easier. This gets wild and out of hand and I have reclaimed it for this year. I haven't cleaned it up yet, but I am gonna be growing over here this year. We are gonna take down the fence so that it's easier for me to manage. We do have our entire property fenced in and so neighborhood dogs and things, they can't really get in here anyway. I have planted a few things in here. These are the Romeo and Juliet um, dwarf cherry trees that I stuck over here. There are quite a lot of strawberry plants that I am going to move. And over here is the tomato trellis. We've grown tomatoes here for a couple of years. I do plan to grow tomatoes here again. But the little tiny tomato starts that are going in here, they are itty bitty right now, so it's not time. It gives me time to clean this space up. Those plants are in the greenhouse, so let's go check that out. Hi, sweet girl. Do you guys need a bottle? I think so. Winning, don't you dare. So if this greenhouse doesn't look like it's ready for planting this spring, it's because it's not ready for planting this spring. Not really. Usually by now the greenhouse is well cleaned out and amended and prepared to grow in, but we're changing things up this year. We've been growing in this greenhouse this will be the third summer. We have decided that I don't exactly love growing in ground in here. Over the winter, which is the whole point of having a greenhouse is to grow over the winter, the grass that is on our property is dead. And because of that, it's not soaking up a lot of moisture. And just a lot of that seeps in in the ground here. And it's quite muddy and very wet. And it's just not a good growing environment. So we have a plan that we're going to execute very, very soon of converting this greenhouse into a raised bed greenhouse. Here's a sneak peek preview of what the layout is going to look like. We are going to be using Birdie's raised beds from Epic Gardening. But for now, this is what it looks like. There actually are quite a few things growing in here. Our parsnips have really exploded in the last couple of weeks. I was peeking down at the soil level the other day to see what I could see got roots coming in down there pretty white roots it's still going to be a little bit before we can harvest but this is exciting i have had success with parsnips in the past but they can be a little bit hard to get to germinate they did really well in this bed and they've continued to do well in this bed i have been keeping track of the moisture levels in the bed with this moisture meter in order to get good long roots i want them to sort of reach for water so down real low we do still have some moisture it's moist down low but as you come higher up it gets less so see it's not super moist up you know three inches down but down where we want the roots to go it is so they'll be reaching for it over here i have a broccoli row that you know, it's getting quite overgrown with weeds and things, even though I have weed fabric down here. But we have harvested a lot off of these broccoli plants. We have our initial harvest of that center head, but then we have all of these little side shoots and these are delicious. I don't remember what variety this is. This may be the Gypsy Hybrid Broccoli. I really do like growing that, but they put out a lot of side shoots. So it looks like I need to come out here later with my basket and retrieve those. They're really good in like a stir fry. I have put them on focaccia before. That might be what I do again, cause that was good. This trellis right here, I had grown some peas on it. You can tell that they have 
started to grow again. We are seeing some pods with little peas growing in them. This is just gonna be kind of a bonus crop. I've sort of ignored this particular space. Over here, I had some cauliflower plants where the center rotted. So the center where we get the head just stopped growing. It rotted out probably due to the saturated ground in here. But I noticed that basically all of these cauliflower plants decided to put out, I don't know, a second plant and they're trying to head up again in there. So we might actually get some cauliflower. This one is a little bit past prime for harvest, but we can still eat this. But this is not the original plant. The original plant is back here. This shriveled up and died and the center rotted out and the plant decided to put a sister on and give us a harvest anyway. Isn't that cool? And here we are again. This is the dead plant or dying. It's not good. It's not great. And this is the good side. And there is a tiny cauliflower in there. And I don't want to meddle too hard because I don't want to kill it. But can you see that in there? See? See the cauliflower? That's cool. These beautiful plants with their lovely flowers. These are Brussels sprouts. We have gotten a couple harvests off the Brussels sprouts, but they are gone by at this point. So I've just let them flower. Number one, I think it's beautiful. And the pollinators, when it is pollination time, have really been loving it. I actually just noticed a honeybee over here. See that pretty girl taking a nap on the flower. The pollinators have been loving it in here and we can collect the seed. I won't be collecting all of this seed. These flowers here, when they're pollinated, they turn into these pods, which eventually swell with seed. Can you see it there? And one plant is gonna have plenty of seed for a lot of people, for a lot of Brussels sprouts for a lot of years. So I don't need all of this. But it sure is pretty anyway. I like walking in here and seeing this. The other people see a mess, I just see beauty. Those cauliflower plants died or became, looked like they weren't gonna be giving us anything probably two months ago and I left them in and it turns out it was worth it. That's cool. There are a few more plants over here. I do have some purple cabbage. This particular one has started putting on a head, which is good. This one looks like it's putting on two heads. There's one here and there's one here. I'm pretty sure this is one plant giving two heads. I had quite a few of those last year. And then here's another one, putting a head in the center. If you squeeze the center of the plant, you can feel that it's a lot more dense. There's like a little ball forming. So that's exciting. My kids specifically requested some purple cabbage. So I've, I've got a few in here for them. Our green stock looks like we may be seeing some sort of ant slash fungus gnat bloom, but it really hasn't been a problem. The plants are doing well. These are Peruviana zinnias that I had to re-sow. We had a freeze that got into the greenhouse and did kill off just a few plants. I was surprised what actually did survive, but I got to replant the zinnia and it's like nothing ever happened. I do have a couple different varieties of celery. I believe that the one up here is a as a dwarf pink variety and then down here is like a green variety of celery. It might have been a little bit late to plant celery but it's been a while since I've tried and I figured we'd stick some in. On this tier I have a dwarf variety of tomato. This is the orange hat tomato and they only get to be about this tall so that's gonna be fun. This tier we put in a purple bok choy that looks like it's doing well. I'm really enjoying the pop of color that this gives. And down below, there's a couple different varieties of radishes. These are actually not super far away from being harvested. It was a few weeks ago that we planted the seeds in here and a lot of radish varieties are ready to be harvested within about 28 to 35 days. They are super fast growing, which is good. And you can actually eat the whole plant. So obviously a lot of people know that you can eat the bulbs, but we like to saute the greens down. They do have a few little hairs on them, but when you cook these up, those little hairs are essentially melt away and you can't you can't feel them at all. I don't remember the varieties, but I believe the one at the bottom was like a larger Italian variety. The green stock at the other side of the greenhouse is one that I have had strawberries growing in for quite some time. I did just transplant some more strawberries into here. So the ones that look a little limp and sad, those guys are just going through some transplant shock, but I started to see some red the other day. These are definitely ready. Oh, the ants have found that one already. Well, that's unfortunate. That one too. 
Usually growing strawberries up off the ground like this means that you have less of an issue with ants, but if they can figure it out how to climb up there and get them, they will. I can probably sprinkle diatomaceous earth or something like a ring around the green stalk and help solve that issue as long as they haven't like created their nest in the soil in here. Even then, diatomaceous earth is the answer that has been the answer for us in the past. That one looks good. It might have stood to sit another day or so, but I don't want the ants to get to it. I want to eat it. That was really sweet. Sometimes strawberries that aren't quite ripe can be a little bit tart, but that was a good one. There's another one way up here. We'll leave that one. I know the kids and my husband will be excited about this. In these pots over here, I just recently purchased these bonfire peach trees and they did flower. It was gorgeous and they have put on a few little peaches. I have decided to leave some peaches on these plants this year. Really the first year that you have a tree, you need to let their roots develop. Because these are in a container, I'm a little less worried about them. Don't ask me why. I mean, they have roots that need to develop clearly even in a container, but I think they're gonna do okay. I have pulled off several little baby peaches because they were trying to grow, I don't know, there was probably 60 peaches on this one little tree and that's a lot for it to manage. So I've still got quite a few on there and we'll see, we'll be having some peaches this year. Down below, I did sprinkle sow some alyssum. These guys are actually in the brassica family so they are frost tolerant and they've been growing nicely and just started to bloom. They are so lovely. I just purchased some of these key lime, these dwarf key lime bush plants. They have been flowering and I think we had one little fruit, there it is. See that little key lime in there? Now citrus, especially key limes, is very frost tender. So we don't plan to leave these inside this greenhouse because it does freeze in the greenhouse over winter here. What I plan to do is put these in like a rolling bed to where when it needs to go under cover for freezes or over the winter, I can roll them into our house or into our shed, which is heated, it is climate controlled. And hopefully we can have a little bit of key limes because we love key lime pie, the key lime juice would be really good and things like yogurt and key Kiefer, so we're excited about this. I don't think this one has put on any any flowers, but this one did. See them all? It's pretty cool. So here are the plant starts that I was talking about, and there's quite a few here. Basically the whole table is full of starts, and then there's some over there. We'll go look at those in a second. These are pepper plants that we bought at a local nursery just because they're a little bit further along than what I planted. They did look better when we bought them. That particular nursery, that greenhouse has a little bit more shade than mine and so they got they got a little burned when I moved them over but they're gonna be okay. Back here the kids have started some things for their garden. There's some tomatoes and flowers and things. I have two full trays of ground cherries. I don't remember the variety of ground cherry but we were sent these from So Right Seeds. We have 64 plants now which is a lot. Here are my tomatoes and there's a there's an extra probably cauliflower plant that I had volunteer in the greenhouse, but these tomatoes are getting really big for their start pots. I can't remember how long they've been in here, but they're clearly looking for a larger pot and I'm clearly not ready. So this week I plan to buy some solo cups, some red solo cup, cups or whatever color and drilling a hole in the bottom and planting them up, potting them up just to give me a little bit extra time. If a plant like this is in a pot, too long their constricted roots really can kind of suffocate the plant and i don't want them to be stunted at all so these guys really need to get potted up i started a whole tray of zinnia there's all kinds of different colors and pattern varieties in here really excited about that and then these are brand new tomatoes that i've started so i actually wrote the varieties down sometimes i don't these are super sweet 100 which we always have poor germination with these these are pelleted seeds so they have this covering on the outside and in my experience those are really hard to germinate so we've got black strawberry tomato blue cream berries berries crazy cherry it looks like i only have one of those right now dr witchy's orange accordion berkeley tie-dye tomato and alice's dream so got of quite a few little baby tomatoes as well as some bigger ones. Over here are my peppers and eggplants in this tray. I had about a 50% germination in here. 
And then this is what I think we're gonna plant in the green stock. These are Tiny Tim tomatoes. So a lot like the dwarf tomato that's over in this green stock, they don't get very big. The seed packet said that they'll be about a foot tall. And so I think they're gonna be perfect in that green stock. Looks like we even have a tiny little flower bud coming on. So yeah, let's see, do we have roots? Oh yeah, there's just the littlest little root. But it's ready, we'll move that over. going on right now there are two other growing spaces that I didn't even get to show you today mostly because there's nothing going on in them right now but it's going to be a pretty big garden year and this is going to mark the first of many garden tours throughout the season I'm still a little bit undecided if I'm going to start doing weekly tours right now or if that will come you know as the season progresses but stick around you're not going to want to miss it mm -hmm. 